Hey, it's Lacey Broussard, and this is the Multi-Orgasmic Mama podcast. From sex and motherhood, birth and relationships, communication and intimacy building, and Taoism and Tantra, we explore topics such as self-care, self-pleasure, body image, jade eggs, the feminine cycles, creativity and business, and modern spirituality. The Multi-Orgasmic Mama is a place to come for true stories and transformational advice on how to be a mama and a multi-orgasmic woman too. Hey, Katerina, how are you doing today? Hi, lovely. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm so excited to chat to you. I know. I'm super excited to have you on. And I just want to go ahead and start by leaving it open-ended. Um, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do and your family and all of that? Sure. So um, I am a mama to a five-year-old. And um, I'm based in South Africa in Cape Town, beautiful Cape Town. So I'm in the peak of summer right now. <laughs> um, and what I do is I support mamas and mamas-to-be to feel more calm and confident and connected. And when I say connected, I really see it in these like three different buckets. So really feeling more connected to themselves and then feeling more connected to their children and also just feeling more connected to their calling or their purpose or what this contribution is that they're here to make in the world. Because I feel like those are three really important buckets of connection and we often feel like they're at odds with each other um, and it's hard to access that quality. So that's the, the focus of the work that I do um, through a combination of coaching and I bring in Kundalini yoga um, and dance, whatever, whatever it is, there's a huge toolbox, um, but that's really what we're, we're working towards um, is just bringing in this, these, this feeling that I think is very natural for us to have to actually feel calm and confidence connected as mamas, um, but that we feel is pretty inaccessible to us. Yeah, that's how I got introduced to you from a mutual uh, friend of ours. And you were running what was it, the Miracle Mamahood Circle or Tribe or something. Yeah, yeah. I have um, a Miracle Mamahood Facebook group. Um, and, I, you know, it's, it's, it's the whole idea that um, I think we are raised – um, in a culture where we're taught that when we become mothers, somehow we lose our sense of freedom. Um, and my personal experience was a little bit the opposite of that. Um, and so how can we have a space where we can really examine what our experience of motherhood is and become conscious co-creators of what that is? Not really buying into the whole like, you know, motherhood is so easy and it's like so natural, which is like, you know, we hear that and then we feel bad when we're crappy mama. <laughs> um, and then there's kind of the other side, which is like, oh, motherhood sucks, you know, until the kids are gone, like you basically don't have a life, you know, you're kind of sitting around waiting for the kids to go off to college, which is also like, you know, like who actually wants to suffer that many years? Um, because I think it, it feels suffering, you know, it feels like a, a su if if, if it's not free, then it feels like suffering. So um, how can we not buy into basically, you know, all these things we're fed about what motherhood is and rather create it um, and, and tap into like the magic of motherhood and the miracles and, and use it as a way to feel freer instead of more constrained, which I think is kind of what we default into um, unless we're willing to really examine what, what we're fed and what we learn from our mothers and our mother's mothers and basically everyone. Yeah, it's so true about that uh, conditioning around losing your freedom when you become a mom. Because I remember my mom being like, when I was like, have a baby, I'm not taking care of it because your life is over, not mine, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, how terrible is that, you know? Because, um, yeah, and I know so many um, women who want to be mothers, like they have a desire to be mothers, but they're just putting it off, you know, I think, um, you know, part of it has to do with the modern day and education and the career ladder or whatever. But part of it also is just, 
Um, I think we all as beings have this deep desire to be free. And so obviously, if we think when we have children, we lose our freedom, we're going to postpone that as much as possible. Um, and like get our life in and then have kids. Um, because that's the, the rational, you know, that's the rational deduction that we make. Um, and so, and then it, you know, it becomes more difficult for some women to have children. And then we believe that also we're too old and then the clock is ticking or has ticked. And then all of a sudden we're like, wait, but I really wanted to be a mother, but I postponed it because I don't want to lose my freedom. And it becomes like, you know, so <laughs> it's like just questioning all of that and what, what that um, actually means for us as, as women in a modern age who want to be mothers, but also um, more than that. Yeah, such a common narrative. So I'm curious about how you got into all of this and how you found freedom and motherhood, as you just explained. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, maybe I can say what, what I was doing before I was doing this work. So um, before I was a mother, I was still working around the theme of motherhood. Um, I worked with nonprofit organization. So I was leading these multi-million dollar um, global maternal and child health programs across, um, in particular Africa, some Asian countries as well. <clears throat> so supporting um, mothers and babies and in countries where that are more lower resourced, focusing really on, you know, survival, because that's, that's the need, right? It's like these survival needs. And so I was doing that for about a decade um, and then, you know, getting it all in <laughs> before I become a mother. Um, and I, um, in the process of doing that, I actually got really sick and ended up in the hospital and was really, really sick and a lot of pain. And I had a moment where I was sitting there in the ICU in so much pain that I actually had the thought, you know, like I'm ready to go. Like, you know, I went through the whole thing in my head. I was like, you know, I've lived, a, I've lived a good life. You know, I've traveled a lot. I've made a difference. I've helped people. Like I have so many friends, like, you know, like it's, it's been good, you know, I'm ready to go. Um, which is, which is great by the way. I think we should all aspire to that. You know, are we living that, that life? Um, but I did have one, regret of something I hadn't experienced in that moment and for me what really came up was motherhood and also partnership um be, you know the family I could say it is family um but just that like love and intimacy and connection with like my own like little tribe and um and I I one of the things that kind of stood out for me was just, I didn't have this thought like, oh, I wish I made a bigger difference, you know, which is so funny because I was all about, you know, making a big difference and having a big impact. And like, there was like none of that, you know? Um, and so I was like, hey, that's interesting. And so, you know, thank goodness I made it through and I came out the other side and um, I was just so happy to be alive. <laughs> Um, and I think in that process of just being in that energy of just being so full of joy and, um, so present to the beauty of life and whatever high vibing I was doing, I actually met my husband, um, within a month or two of getting out of the hospital and, um, and then, you know, eventually we got married and I had my son, but throughout that time I was still doing that work that I was doing. Um, but I'd had this little seed, like, a, you know this is important to me. So when I actually had my son, um, I, I just remember the time came when it was time to go back to work. And the thought that came into my mind was, um, if I'm not doing something that I love 100%, then it's not worth it to be away from him. Um, and I just didn't feel that passion for the work anymore. Um, and in part, you know, I overworked so much and my system was like, you know, I was, I experienced a few months after my son was born, some really serious burnout, um, you know, the opposite of freedom too. So um, I, I just thought, okay, it, it doesn't feel right to go back to what I was doing and whatever I want to do, I want it to feel, um, you know, something that I really feels true to me. And I didn't know what it was. 
Um, and so I just give myself the time to um, explore that. And um, as part of that started healing the burnout that I experienced and as part of that healing journey, I learned so much, you know, starting with nutrition and wellness and then moving into the mind and, and our thoughts um, and then moving into more of a healing kind of journey and trauma um, and then moving into spirituality. And so that's kind of the journey that I went on. And then that's kind of how I support mothers as well. Um, and it just grew out of my own personal experience. Yeah. So what led you or what really started you with, you said you started with kind of nutrition and health. Mm -hmm. Is that a product of you being hospitalized and getting a turnaround or how did that happen? Yeah, well, when I was hospitalized, one of the things that I that really helped me in my recovery was um, removing gluten and dairy from my diet. Like I, when I came out of the hospital, I just I could my digestive system was so gone. Like I was, I was basically eating like mush for breakfast and lunch so that I could digest dinner. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> um, and so. I saw how powerful nutrition was for me in healing. Um, and so I knew when I was experiencing burnout and my energy was just gone, I knew that there was something there from a, a nutritional perspective. Um, and also I'm just, I, I love to geek out on gut health. I got really interested in that um, and the microbiome and just, there's so many, so much cool stuff coming out um, in that space. And so I just kind of followed my interest. That's kind of what I did. You know, I, when I decided I wasn't going to go back to the work that I was doing before, I just thought, okay, what sounds fun and interesting? And I just followed that, what was interesting for me personally. Um, and, and that's kind of how I got into it. So nutrition was just like the logical starting point. Like I have, I have no energy. So like, how can I shift this? Um, and I studied hormones and hormonal health to see really what was going on there um, at the hormonal level too, to kind of take that box. Cause I think um, sometimes some of the women that, that I've supported, they want more energy. And so they immediately jump to, um, you know, especially the ones who are more oriented towards spirituality or coaching or, you know, um, mental blocks or energy blocks, they jump straight to that. And yes, there's all of that, but there's also like feeding our, ourselves at a cellular level like the mitochondria also needs some fuel so it, it is important to, to, to check you know the hormones and all of that and it's all connected too um so it's you know one piece of the pie yeah so did you become a health coach first yeah yeah and when i did it i thought you know I'm, i just i want to do this for me it'll be helpful for my family um, and that's how it began. And then when I started coaching, I found even though I was saying I was a health coach and I was supporting women in this way, um, women were just coming to me for like a lot of stuff. So it was like a lot of life coaching stuff. Um, and so I kind of just worked with, with what appeared. Yeah. Yeah. So I know that there's a big spirituality aspect that mm -hmm. Can you tell me about that and how mm -hmm. that for you? Yeah, so um, that was a surprise because I was not raised in any sort of religious context. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, my parents are not religious and I didn't have any access to or awareness of what spirituality was and how that's different from religion. Um, and so it was just like, uh, no, that's not me. And, uh, I remember my very first website actually said, I don't do the woo, you know, like we just like get stuff done, you know, <laughs> like I'm going to coach you and you're going to reach your goals and we get stuff done. Um, and so, you know, I'm just sharing this to say that, um, I think a lot of us see people who are into spirituality or, or do spiritual things, whatever those look like that we observe them do and we're like, wow, they really know what they're doing or they must've been doing this for ages or like, you know, they're like, I can never do that. And I think um, just recognizing that um, that's not necessarily true. I think we're all learning and, and it can be a very quick learning curve if we feel called and interested to explore spirituality 
um, or anything for that matter to just follow that intuition and not be like, no, that's not me. So for me, I just, I just started getting more curious about it because I think for me, a lot, a, a lot of, um, what I was seeing, especially in the context of burnout was, um, I just started asking these, you know, these deeper questions. Just, I found a lot of women who came for support who weren't like in their darkest of the dark, you know, I call them their, the, the bathroom meltdown moments, which is what I had. Um, for me was, I, you know, I was just in my bathroom in the middle of the night, like crying. And I was like, something needs to change. Like, you know, I feel disconnected from myself and from my son and I don't care about this work anymore. And like, who am I? Um, so I found that the women who came to me in that state were willing to really explore and make the changes um, to create the life that they want. Whereas a lot of the women who weren't quite there yet um, were just feeling overwhelmed or, you know, there, there wasn't like that desperation of something needs to change. Um, we would work to sh kind of shift some patterns and behaviors and then they would fall back into it. So I knew there was like a deeper healing that needed to happen and I didn't know what that was. And what I found for me was um, just through my own journey was a lot of it was looking at trauma work and doing some of that healing, you know, of the physical body, but also just, um, just having more I think as we work on our physical body and we become more clear vehicles um, that we just start um, having a more open mind and more attuned to spirituality and so that's just what what happened to me I, I went and I actually was doing a juice um, cleanse I went to this beautiful resort in Portugal and I did a week-long juice cleanse again it was for nutrition, I wasn't focused on losing weight or anything like that. I was just like, you know, I want more energy. At the time, I was like, I just want more energy. <laughs> yeah. um, so I was like, you know, raw juice, and I don't need to make it. Somebody's going to prepare it, and I get to just hang out. Um, I think my son was maybe like six or seven months at the time. It was like the first trip I took away from him. I took a week, and I did this juice cleanse in Portugal. And um, in, in that week, I think, you know, my, um, physically, like my, my physical body was just so clear. Um, they had a bunch of yoga classes at, at the center that you could take. And, I, you know, I'd done yoga before and I just did it for the physical practice and for stress management. But I attended one of the classes and it was a kundalini yoga class, which is the yoga that I usually do and have done, you know, before then, again, just for like stress release. And I was in the class and we did a meditation and she played this mantra and we're doing the meditation. And as I'm doing this meditation, I just like, I start crying and I didn't know what it was. Like I'd never experienced anything like that before. I think at the time I was, I've always been kind of a crier, but not like in a public kind of like, I'm in a yoga class crier kind of way. <laughs> I am a um, class crier. So <laughs> yeah, I like, I'm, I'm, a, I'm in like a, every single movie in the movie theater crier, you know, cause I'm uh, so empathetic in that way. But you know, like Mufasa dies. I'm like, oh gosh. <laughs> um, but it was, it was, it was a different experience, and it, and it wasn't sad. It was like, it was, um, it was really, it was just a really different experience. And I was like, I don't know what this is, but there's something I need to explore here. Um, I just felt like there was a remembrance. Like I know this. I've never heard this song before. Like I've never heard this mantra before. I've never done this, but, but like I know this. Um, and that just got, you know, sparked my interest. And I was like, let me explore that more. And I eventually ended up doing a teacher training um, in for Kundalini Yoga. And then just, you know, like through that process, really just learned and remembered. Yeah. So again, it was again, for me, I was like, I'm never going to, I'm never going to teach yoga. Like, who, you know, like I have my, my master's in, is in like economics, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> like I'm never actually going to teach yoga, but I'm going to do this for me and just to learn um, like what's, what, what was that and what, what is this and what is there for me to learn in this space. And then what I learned, I was like, Oh my God, like everybody needs to know this, especially um, some of the teachings around women and, and motherhood. I was just like, okay, like there's no way I can't not share this. So, so that's kind of how it all pieced together. Yeah. So uh, I have a question for you about uh, Kundalini. Could you mm -hmm. what that is for those listening that don't exactly know? 
Yeah, so um, when, when you hear somebody talking about Kundalini, they're really referring to prana or to life force. So just um, we all have this, uh, this infinite life force energy within us that, that resides at the base of our spine. Um, and often you might also hear it referred to as Shakti. And so that this is, and we all have it, it's always there. And so when we talk about Kundalini um, and Kundalini yoga and other references to Kundalini that you might that hear, um, it's all about, okay, how can we tap into that, this energy source within us and basically, you know, un unlock it so that we can use that energy um, because it's always there. And so it's one of the things that um, in, in Kundalini yoga, one of the, one of the things I really loved because I was on this, like this quest for more energy at the time was um, Yogi Bhajan used to say, you know, everybody wants more energy. Everybody is, wants more energy. And that's what people are selling you. Like, I'll help you get more energy. I'll help you get more energy. The truth is we already have energy. We just need to release fatigue. So we just need to figure out, okay, how do I get rid of fatigue? <laughs> you know, and what's blocking me from accessing the energy that's already there. And so um, it's, for me, it was like, oh, okay, I don't need to like go around looking for this energy. It's within me. I just need to figure out, okay, how, how can I harness this energy? How can I direct this energy? Um, and, and that's how I got really curious about just, you know, in the physical body and the energy body, what's actually going on in addition to the spirituality piece um, in, in yoga. Because a lot of classes you go and you kind of feel it, and you, but um, in Kundalini, I, I felt like there was more of a, a deeper explanation and understanding, not like just for teacher trainings. But if you find really good teachers, you'll actually learn as you go about the body and how it works and, and the energy body and how you can actually tap into this beautiful energy that's always there. I love that so much about how we're always all full of energy. It's just releasing the box to it. Uh, that's exactly how I would describe uh, sexual energy and desire as well. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Because in the Taoist system, you know, you have Jing, Qi, and Shen, it's three different energy systems, which I imagine is somehow linked to Kundalini in some way or another, but and maybe they came from different traditions. I'm not sure about all of that. But yeah, in the Taoist tradition, we all have Jing, which is your sexual energy. And it's all there. It's always, always there, you know. It's it's just that there's so many layers and blocks mm -hmm. on blocks. And, and you include some trauma and some cultural conditioning on top of it. <laughs> and then yeah. we're 30 and we're like, wow, where's my sex drive? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's the same concept. I, I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. And, and it, makes it, it makes it easier almost. I mean, easier and harder, but... Um, we don't have to do so much work. It's just there, <laughs> you know, um, it's just getting clear on, you know, what are those blocks? And I'm not saying that's easy work, especially because there is so much trauma and cultural conditioning and so many layers. Um, I found in the work that I do with women, uh, we just spend a lot of time working on that, on the, the first and second chakras, really working on releasing fears and, um, and that, and just a lot of um, shame and guilt that we store in that area. Um, that because until we do that, um, we can't really show up as the women and the mothers that we want to be. Um, because we, in order for us to have our heart, our heart space, our heart energy, our heart chakra open, the the bottom chakras also need to be, you know. <laughs> They, they can't be all over the place, right? We can't have blocks there because they need to support. We need that strength in the lower chakras to be able to support us in opening our heart. Otherwise, every time we like try to open our heart, something like some little thing happens and we're like, no, I'm going to close off. I'm going to close off because that's our instinct. And so we need to have the strength um, and the groundedness to be able to show up open-hearted no matter what, you know, and that can be with poop hits the fan in your business or if like your kid hits you with poop, you know, like <laughs> lots, of poop references. <laughs> lots of poop references, um, which is appropriate if we're talking about the lower chakras, but, um, because you know, that's, that's the work. And I think that's 
kind of what what we've seen in a lot of the spiritual traditions is for a long time there was a focus on the upper chakras and and enlightenment and and all those beautiful things without focusing on below the heart and the lower ones but without that base we we just can't we can't keep our heart open and we we can't um you know stay grounded and connected uh, we have a very loose and flimsy foundation you know and then we get our head cut off and then we're not really here and then we can't access that beautiful energy that that we all so desperately crave both you know to show up in life and to show up feeling vibrant and also you know to show up in our sex life and also to create life uh, if we're trying to conceive as well so yeah that's so beautiful and <clears throat> Yes, to going and working on that the lower chakras first because uh, in my own experience of felt that as well. I call it spiritually bypassing. <laughs> like, yeah, when you try to to attain enlightenment or you know you go and do all this meditation and stuff, it's like I don't know. That's why working on sexuality is so important for women because we have so much shit around sexuality. It's like. Mm -hmm can't bypass that your sexuality is a huge part of you you know um mm -hmm. you can't just leave it out and expect mm -hmm. it to turn on by and never really deal with it or never really go into it and you know and, but it seems like to me that they'd be missing out on I, I can say that very confidently that you're missing out on so much that life has to offer yeah yeah, and, and I also see when I think of um, sexuality, I also, for me, I really associated with play. You know, there's obviously the, the pleasure and the sensuality aspect, but I, I also see it very much associated with play and playfulness. And I think we are, again, raised in a culture where we like become adults and playing is not allowed, you know? <laughs> um, and when we become mothers, we, we witness our children playing. Um, and it's so free and so full of joy and there's no purpose to it and there's no right or wrong or shame unless, you know, we start showing them that there is. Um, and so it's, it's like about just giving ourselves permission to just do what feels good, you know, whether it is sexual in nature or whether it's like, I don't know, playing in the rain, you know, just like ridiculous things um, to just, allow yourself to have that more playful energy in your life because that's what actually makes life enjoyable. You know, if, if, if we skirt around those things, all of it, then what are we actually doing here? You know, yeah. it's like all the good things. Yeah. And what you're saying about play being a huge part of sexuality, there's really five stages of sexuality and one is innocent. And in that innocence, um, you know, we're often stripped of our ability to claim our innocence and our sexuality when you're a baby. If you touch yourself, a lot of times the parent will pull the hand away or say, no, don't touch that. Or So we're often stripped of that innocent piece of us. And then the next stage is play. Like, you know, kids, six, seven-year-olds, you know, they might want to look at each other's parts just because they're curious being able to reclaim innocence and play and my work with people is one of the biggest things that um biggest challenges because they've lost that they've lost that ability mm -hmm. and i think uh yeah it's so important to be able to have that and i know that you talk a lot about presence as well and so presence and mm -hmm. play within sexuality is super important and when you bring the presence into your playfulness it can be such an amazing awakening experience so um i'm curious about you know how you teach presence and i know that you do a lot of that with the moms that you coach so could you yeah a little bit? yeah i think it's difficult to be playful without being like fully present i'm just contemplating that as you link those two i love that yeah i always talk about so i think um a lot of us are focused on being more productive like somehow we've convinced ourselves or drank the kool-aid that if only we can be more productive then you know all our problems will fade into the dust um, especially as mothers because we're juggling so many things and we feel like we have so little time and 
what and, and women used to come to me a lot for help with productivity and I would do that because I'm, I'm I, you know I'm all into productivity and ingenious however what I what I found is you know no matter how much how productive we are it's, there's still a million things we could do and we still feel like crap at the end of the day so I'm like okay that cannot be the answer you know it's actually um, not the answer and and what does it look like perhaps it's very much the opposite it's not about squeezing in as much as possible but just getting the most out of every single moment that we have and so what came to me you know for me is like okay can I just stop trying to be productive and rather start focusing on being present because I'm great at multitasking and getting a gazillion things done however um, I, I noticed in myself when both in my business and also in work in just spending time with my son and with loved ones is if I can just focus on one thing at a time and be fully present for that, then that moment is worth a thousand moments. Um, and also ends up if it's work related, being more productive too, even though that's not the objective. Right. And so can we focus on bringing our full presence to the different things that we're doing? Um, and, so that kind of was just my experiment. You know, I was like, I'm done being productive. <laughs> I'm just going to show up and be present. And um, what I found is, okay, first of all, it's difficult for us, right? Especially for those of us, which I put my hand up to, who are, have a tendency to be overachieving or perfectionist or just like, you know, doers. Because we're so used to moving. And so when I started... Um, I decided, okay, you know, if I want to do this, what does that look like? Okay, I should probably meditate. Everybody's talking about meditating. And I sat down to meditate, and it was like the longest minute of my life. <laughs> it was not in a good way, not in a good way, right? We want time to just expand, extend forever unless we're sitting still. <laughs> and, and, and I was like, I was kept looking, I like would like kind of open my eye and look at my little, um, I think, I think it was my phone. I was like, God, has it been a minute yet? Um, and it was the longest minute ever. And I was so restless. And I was like, this is the worst. Like, like I don't get it. Like, what's the point in this? And so I just want to really honor anybody who um, is interested in exploring mindfulness or presence and things like meditation. If it feels difficult, that's totally normal, right? Because it's exactly the opposite of what we have learned. Um, we should be doing all the time. And so um, I just, that was kind of how, how I began. And so for me, it was as I started just giving myself the space and experimenting with different types of meditation and seeing what I could tolerate at, you know, at different points <laughs> along my journey, um, I just kind of followed what help bring me into a more um, mindful state and more peaceful. So for me, the barometer was like, okay, do I just feel less stressed? Um, over time, as I tried different practices, what I found for me was it was, it was really just the breath. You know, there's such super simple breathing exercises that we can do that immediately bring us into uh, the present moment. And so uh, it's, it's just like the most simple thing. It's so ridiculous. Um, but that's that's really how I started and that's how I started teaching I, I would teach more just simple breathing exercises you know just something you could do for a minute that would completely shift your um, you out of a stress response and activate your parasympathetic nervous system and just get you there you know so this is again before I brought in the spirituality piece uh, and all the wonderfulness there is just there's just certain things like, for example, we cannot breathe slowly and be in a stress response. Like, physiologically, that's impossible. Also, we cannot laugh and be in a stress response. We can't be in fight, flight, or freeze and laugh. So if you're feeling stressed, if you can laugh, find a way to laugh, it immediately shifts you into a rest and digest response physiologically and shifts your hormones so it's just like simple little things like that that, that, that you can do to get um, in a more present state. Now, when I started looking more, getting more curious about it, as I saw the effect it was having in my life, I realized, okay, there's like, there's different levels of presence. Um, and I suspect there's gazillions of levels, but where I'm at right now is 
Um, and I think about this a lot as it relates to being um, with my son, for example, but this could apply as in being with your partner or um, in other areas of your life is okay. The, the first piece of presence is okay. I'm there, you know, we're like in the same place. So that's one level of presence. Um, the second level is okay. I'm here and um, my devices are switched off and I'm not distracted by other stuff. I'm like actually here with you. Um, and I'm focused on, on being with you. That's like another level of presence. And again, this applies if you're like in the bedroom, right? And then there's like a third level of presence, which is I'm here and I'm present and I've switched off all the distractions. And I'm also just aware of myself and conscious of myself as a being, you know, of my thoughts that, you know, we can't stop our thoughts. Our thoughts are going and, 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 and that's okay. But can I, navigate that and what comes up for me in this moment if my kid decides to throw a tantrum or if like you know something in the bedroom doesn't go how i want it to go right like can i be here and um, fully conscious of what what is happening here and interact in a conscious way um and and just be aware of myself in that in that sense um and then the kind of the next level which is the one that i'm really loving at the moment is okay, <laughs> you can get deeper and deeper with it, is okay. I'm like here and I'm aware, um, and I'm aware of myself as a, you know, as like a being, you know, like, you know, what's going on for me, like physically and, and spiritually and all that, um, is just being aware of the, the, the energy dynamics, right, um, of what's happening between the individuals in the room. So, I think when we think of being present, we focus on, okay, like who, who we are and where we are. Um, but are we thinking about the quality that we are bringing to the interaction in terms of the energy? So for example, with my son, I think of, okay, what is the quality I actually want to bring to my interaction with him? And for me, it's like, it's love and compassion. So when I'm with him, Am I consciously creating the environment, you know, energetically with myself by putting myself in that state of love and compassion? Can I be the presence of love and compassion and really embody that and bring that quality into the interaction that I'm having? Um, and so it's, it's, it's almost like, okay, um, it's kind of also consciously creating the interaction and just being aware of what the, the energy dynamics are, um, especially as women, because energetically we are, we have, we are so strong that we can actually set the, um, I, when I'm talking about it in the family context, I always say the mother sets kind of the energetic frequency of the home. There's like this tapestry of different individuals and beings like Coke, cohabitating and there's like all sorts of crazy stuff going on but as mothers we can actually set the frequency of that kind of the baseline of it because you know when mom's having a rough day then everybody kind of has a rough day and when mom's good like it's generally good you know especially if it's a you know at your family is uh, your partner is male then if he can be in a bad mood like people can still be okay usually right <laughs> right <laughs> Um, it doesn't, it doesn't influence the dynamic as much. It just doesn't, you know? And so even if you're not into spirituality as much or energy as much, like I think most, most people would agree with that. Um, and so it's just noticing, okay, how much influence I have again, when you're, when you are connected to that energy within you, that Shakti, that Kundalini energy and are aware of your capacity as a being, to to um, manipulate or not so much manipulate but direct um and harness that energy okay if i have all this energy and i can harness it um and i'm basically beaming it out you know into my environment and space okay what am i doing with that energy you know like what 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 is that quality of that energy that i'm bringing so i hope that was clear <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that was a great explanation of the different levels of presence. So yeah. I, as you were talking, I had a question pop into my mind too. Mm -hmm. As you started to focus more on presence over productivity, did you find mm -hmm. you actually became more productive? 
Oh my gosh, so much, so much more. Um, because I think we take for granted that things are not necessarily linear, right? So I can give you a really concrete example. Um, and this starts getting into the beautiful space of, of, of manifestation and, and such. But um, so earlier this year, I had the thought, okay, I want to, you know, start speaking more um, on stage. I did that for a while and then I kind of stopped and I was like, oh, I'd like to do it more. Um, and so if I was in my in productive mode, which is, I've done this before, I've landed speaking engagements before, um, it's, it's very linear. You know, there's certain things you can do and like, you know, you can probably do some courses and learn how to do it and like how to connect with people and like, you know, build up your resume and all that stuff. And I've done that before and it works, right? But it, it still takes time. There's like steps and it's logical and linear and like you kind of do the work and it feels like a lot of work. And this time I was... Um, I, I, I thought, okay, I would like to speak more, but I was kind of like, yeah, you know, it was like in the sphere. Um, and then I just, I sat down and I meditated, even though I had a gazillion different things to do. Um, and this was not a priority at all at the time. I was actually like right before I was launching, um, something. So there was like a lot of things that it was one of those days I was like, oh, do I really have time to meditate? And I was like, no, I'm going to do this. And I sat down and I meditated. And like, you know, as I meditated, I was like, I just got the idea. I'm like, reach out to this person and offer to speak at this event. And I was like, okay. And I just, like, I did it in that day, like one of a couple of things that I did. It wasn't necessarily the most productive day ever. And it was like a month later, I was on a, like, a pretty big stage. Um, that's, you know, just because of that moment of, that I sat and connected and listened um, to my intuition. And so I think um, I've started calling it universal productivity productivity right like we think we we can be super productive and create all these things and and there's all these linear steps but it doesn't necessarily have to be that way and so um if we can just sit still and tune into our intuition and to the guidance that we're receiving from everywhere and everyone um you know guides or angels or whatever is true for anybody um then then all of a sudden like we tap into that universal productivity where what would take us forever to do can take us like a month. And so um, it's just, it's yes. And it's not necessarily because I'm super productive in the moment when I'm super present, which is the case, you know, you're a lot, you can just get a lot more done if you're focusing on one thing because all your energy is going into that one thing. But it's like, it's more than that. It's when you're in that state, you're also, receptive and tuned in and you just notice ideas and inspiration and opportunities as they arise um, and and then you can just accelerate things even though that's not your objective it just becomes easier like the struggle is is out the hustle is out um, like I, I feel like the less we can hustle then the more we can do even though that's not the point um, and it's been hard for me like I said like I like my default is like let's do this like um, and so it's really been a practice of learning to do that and trusting that, um, actually, you know, it happens and it, in doing that, you see it happening in your life and you can believe it more <laughs> that, you know, it's not like the harder and the more you do that actually, um, gets you the farther. It's, it's like, that's not, it doesn't line up that way. Yeah. And maybe that's why we're both in Kate Northrop's origin community. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, it's all about getting more by doing less. And mm -hmm. I joined that community. That's one of the biggest lessons that I've learned personally because it's very type A, very much mm -hmm. goal oriented. And <laughs> the kind yeah. Of, so, if yeah. You focus on one thing for a short amount of time, like you'll get it done. And then you can focus on another thing and get it done. But when you're trying to do 50 things at once, it's like freaking and so mm -hmm. I've learned that uh, too, mm -hmm. that when we really dial in on something and become ultra present with it, it's, a, it's like a vortex. Mm -hmm. Like something happens in that space where all the BS that, and all the thoughts that might be spinning it just disappear. And then you actually become more productive because everything is more aligned and it's inspired. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so authenticity 
because you're able to sit in the presence of that. You know, you're not trying to get to a goal, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's like that beautiful um, flow state that we always hear about is, okay, how can I just be in that space more? And certainly it has nothing to do with trying to be more productive. Like, you know, and I think some people try to be in flow and access the flow state so they can be more productive. Uh, and it's, it's like when you go into it with that intention, then, then that's not going to work. You know, <laughs> it's not about like, I love a good hack, but it's not about a bunch of hacks. Right. It's just about a completely different way of being I love that. Um, and showing up. And how can we just do that more and show up in that energy more in all areas of our lives? Like it shouldn't be like, okay, it's work time. So let me be super present right. um, so that I can get stuff done. It's like, no, how can I just be more present in more areas of my life so that I can show up fully present for my partner, for my child, for my business, for myself, for, for, for whatever. And um, I actually had a really fun and interesting moment recently where um, I was doing the dishes. This was um, just a few weeks ago. And I just had so much fun doing the dishes. And I was like, this is so weird. And you know why? It's we're actually having a big drought here. And so like water is so scarce. And um, I was, I was speaking to a friend of mine and I was saying, you know, it's, it's so difficult to like have this abundance mindset and all that when you're literally, you know, are like using bath water to flush toilet, you know, like water is so scarce and it's like something that you interact with on a daily basis. Um, and she said, she said, yes. And doesn't that make you appreciate it so much more? So I'm sitting there washing the dishes, thinking about how grateful I am that we have water to wash the dishes and how like we take that for granted and how a lot of people in the world, well, I know, you know, I've worked in development and in, in, in areas um, that don't have access to water. So I've always been very aware that there's certain places where people don't have it. And it's a valuable resource, but to have that um, experience myself doing something so usually mundane and that people really dislike such as washing the dishes right because we don't use the machine because it uses too much water so we're hand washing everything is um i just have that like moment of just gratitude and appreciation and i really just felt that so like can we even be super present when we're washing the dishes and find joy in something like that um as opposed to again thinking okay i'm gonna be present for this reason or for this reason in this area of my life but can i just find ways to tap into that quality no matter what I'm doing, you know, even if it is just washing the dishes. Um, so. <laughs> so how do we bring more presence into our sexuality? <laughs> it's, more, it's the same. Like I don't, I don't see it, it for me. I don't see it as separate boxes. I feel like as we, um, do the work of becoming more mindful and aware and conscious and present as beings, then naturally we just start doing that in all the different areas of our lives. Um, I think what becomes challenging is when there's other people involved who aren't necessarily doing it side by side with you. Um, I think that's when it becomes challenging because you're showing up in a different state and you feel like they're not. And that gets frustrating, you know, and with a kid, you can be more forgiving because they're just a kid. But if it's your partner, you're like, you know, when it comes to sexuality, you're like showing up like fully present. Um, and so, you know, you can feel like you're not being met um, or like there's a disconnect there. Um, and so I think that's, that's the, the piece there is like, okay, how do I navigate this? Um, this me being more present um, with somebody who isn't necessarily also at the same time becoming more present um, and, and how do I function in that? And what does that mean for how I show up? So I think for me, like that's the more interesting question um, as opposed to like, how can we bring more presence? Cause I think if we bring it into ourselves and into our lives, then it will naturally trickle into our sexual lives um, but there's like two beings showing up, um, like 
the energy of two people um, in two different states of presence. And so in a very intimate way, you know, it's different if it's a work environment and a team, it still matters if you're trying to figure out, okay, how can I work with my team um, and, and help them tune into this quality too, so that that can be like the energy of the work that we're producing. Mm -hmm. um, but in partnership, it's so intimate, you know, or also if you don't have a long-term partner, it's like, it's different people and different energies. And so like, how do you relate to that? Um, I think that kind of becomes what we, we start to master more. It's like, okay, what does it mean to be a fully present and conscious person in, um, in an environment where there's unpredictability around me, right? In terms of how the other person is. Yeah, so what would you consider the opposite of I think what's coming to me is just like the opposite of those different, like the little steps of presence, right? I think, you know, um, f first there just somebody might just not be around or um, you might not, you know, sometimes we live in a home and we feel like we don't really see our partner as much, you know, or kind of like we run into each other, but there's like no contact <laughs> sexually and even verbally, you know, just like especially um, if people are working, you know, regular jobs, it's like, th like there's just very little amount of present time together, right? And then there's like, okay, we're together, but like we're all looking at our phones and catching up and we're watching TV. So there's like distractions and tech and all that stuff. So, okay, okay, can we like get rid of that? Um, and then there's actually the piece of awareness um, and being um, consciously aware of ourselves and who we are and our thoughts and all that. Um, and that's where it becomes more difficult because that's such a personal journey, right? Um, because we get to that state by doing the exploration and the develop personal development and the personal growth and healing trauma. And so that's where we really need to honor. And this is something that, um, you know, in my home, I've had to kind of really get to a point where just honoring that um, there might be some healing that my partner needs to do that he's not ready to do yet. And so until he's willing to do that, this is this is the level at which he can show up and can i be okay with that it's like that becomes the question like do i need him to to show up in a certain way is that my need am i projecting that um can i just show up how i want to show up and just honor how he shows up um in you know in the bedroom in the relationship with my child um, and just honor that that's the state of consciousness that he's at. And is that okay with me? You know, like, I think that kind of becomes the question in, in the relationship because I can't, I can't force him to heal. I can't, you know, I think we, especially those of us who like have a tendency to like mother and nurture, which is so me and also like kind of like almost like a rescuing fixing energy, which also I think is a very common for women. It's like, we just, we just want to pull them along and like, I think there's things we can suggest um, and um, you know, we can lead the way, but I think we lead the way by setting an example and by our presence and then they get curious or they don't and that's okay too. Right. <laughs> um, but I think that's the best way. It can't be uh, like, I can't force you to like heal childhood trauma that you had. Um, and you know, like I can't, force you to heal like penis shame that like was instilled in you when you were like a baby and through a very religious upbringing like I, I just I can't do that for you you know um and so I think a lot of it's just owning that um ourselves and in our specific partnerships to see okay like what is okay for me and what is not okay for me um, in terms of partnership and the different levels that we're at and how do I personally want to navigate that because for some people it's just like you know, like we're different vibrations, it's just not working. And for other people, it's very different. Um, and, and I don't think there's a right answer or not. I think it's like each person's journey to figure out what that looks like, um, to kind of try and get aligned on kind of the, the way in which we're interacting. But that's why the fourth piece of presence, you know, that fourth step of energy matters, because um, as women, especially if, if you're, you know, um, 
interacting with a man sexually, then we have, we energetically um, are 16 times more powerful and sensitive than men. And so um, that's where we can consciously create some, we can still influence them on other levels. <laughs> that sounds really sneaky, right? To create the experience that we want, like what energy are we bringing to that interaction? Um, because that will also affect how they're behaving. So I'm not saying we're like energetically manipulating them, but like if we show up in the bedroom in a certain energy, or if we show up in our home in a certain energy, then that will influence how they show up too. Um, and so um, that's also why it's very cool to learn how to kind of manipulate. Again, I don't like the word manipulate, but how to harness and direct our beautiful energy that we have, the Shakti, the Kundalini, because it, it kind of ripples out and kind of influences people around us for better or worse. We're doing it right. So can we um, find a way to, to do that in a way that's supportive of the environment that we want to create for our family? Oh, I love it so much. Yeah. Learning how to harness that energy and direct it. Uh, I hear from so many women that there's a level of frustration around how we as women are the ones that kind of have to activate something and wake up mm -hmm. more presence sexually with us mm -hmm. for many reasons. One, because there's just not many men uh, taking the next step. There are a lot more women doing it. The rate that women are stepping into their power in all aspect, aspects of their life, so much it's, been, it's just compounded and it's like exponential mm -hmm. right now. So mm -hmm. there are a lot of sexually empowered women out there mm -hmm. who do their own personal growth and work, working with their own trauma and sexual healing and sexual issues and are transmitting their, their true transmission into their men and it is activating men. It mm -hmm. is them to a point where they're going to start taking their own work and bringing it to the level. But it kind of, it, it has to be activated by that Shakti energy. And we carry more of that Shakti, I think, uh, predominantly, or we're at least more aware of it because men have it too. But mm -hmm. you know, we're bringing that into the sexuality piece more consciously right now in this day and age. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I know. It's it's that it's that 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 magical, <laughs> the miracle of the miracle mamahood. It's exactly that. And also, um, I think a lot of it is just also noticing um, how a lot of times we're not receiving what we want or what we need because we're not open to receiving it. Um, and so, whether it's in you know finances or in the bedroom, again, um, I think one of the one of the qualities that we really need to work on is just our receptivity and receiving um, because sometimes we're not conscious that we're the ones that are keeping ourselves from receiving that from our partners as well um, and so that's also you know an area that I've learned a lot in um, kind of pre-motherhood and post-motherhood as well is okay how can I like not just show up fully present but also just really open to receiving and without making assumptions, you know, especially like with sex, like, and if you've been married for a while, you kind of know what's going to happen, what do you expect? And so um, by expecting that all the time, that's also what you're getting, right? Um, like, can you show up um, just open to whatever um, presents itself and, um, and, and, and create a space of um, viewing your partner as somebody who who can show up like spontaneously or differently or in a really connected and present and beautiful way for you or in like a really giving way in a particular you know night or whatever um to just create space for that you know because i think a lot of times like we just assume and like we're doing all the thing ourselves and it's like okay but like i also have to be open to receiving him fully as well um, obviously her fully if you're in a relationship with a woman, but um, I think, you know, we um, just like we do fall into patterns and that's normal. We also perpetuate them by expecting things to be in a pattern, <laughs> right? 
Um, and so kind of just um, playing around with, okay, what are we expecting um, and what are we projecting onto our partners and in what ways are we actually blocking ourselves from having what we want? So that's just like another little piece too. So if you could give us one piece of advice or tip on being, what would it be? Hmm. For me, it's just a recognition that we are that already. Like we are multi-orgasmic mamas. We just don't freaking realize it. You know, like what do we need to do to tap into that more? Again, like I was just washing the dishes. Like, like how lame and unexciting is that? And in that moment, I was able to tap into this beautiful feeling of like gratitude and abundance and like connection with nature. And um, it was, it was like a beautiful, beautiful moment. Right. And so um, to just notice that, that, that is, that's like our nature. Our nature is to be joyous and blissful. Right. That's like our connection to spirit and God is love. Like that quality of love is us. That is like our, our natural frequency. And, and so again, it's like, what are the things that are keeping me from doing that? And yes, there's like healing and all this stuff. And then again, part of it is just like this playfulness. Like, okay, like if I want to, you know, feel most orgasmic and blissful and show up in that way, what are simple things I need to do? Like maybe I need to like um, put flowers all over the place or like play like music that makes me feel a certain way. Like how can I create that environment? To, to just allow that quality that is within me to just be expressed more, you know? So there's like things we can like take out and clear. And there's also like, what can we add in to just make our experience more, um, more blissful in every single moment? Because that, that is actually our natural state. Like I always think of like a baby when they're born, you know, there's like, they're just, they're like, they're just there, you know? there's like no good, no bad, no rules. Like they, they just are there. Um, and they're like happy. And then they sat and they cry and they're happy, you know, like it's, it's all good. <laughs> it's pure. before we've added on like all the rules and guilt and shame and like what's right and wrong and, 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 and such, um, it's kind of disconnected us from this, um, beautiful, uh, innocence, um, blissful state that I think we arrive here with. Um, and so if we can just tap into that and be like, okay, like, like what would make me feel this way? Um, because I am feeling that way. I just don't see it. Like, how can I add more of that to my life? Um, and, and that's it. It's just like, we, we are that we are that we don't need to do anything to be that we are that. Um, so what, how can we activate that more? Awesome. Great advice. Very, very on point. <laughs> well, thank you so much. This has been such a wonderful, deep, uh, pleasant, loving conversation. And I really appreciate your insights and your stories and everything you had to share. Thank you so much for being on. My pleasure. Thanks so much. Bye.